I love this song because it speaks a powerful message um, of God's love for us and as his children we are I there's a picture that it hangs in the church I go to and it's a picture of Christ and he's knocking at the door there there's no handle on his side we have to let him in um, so we have to make sure that we see the love around us and we share that light with the people that we know and make sure to let him into our lives. So um, I hope you all enjoy this one.
that he has for you. God knows our plans. He knows what's in front of us. And as he knows what's in front of us, we are able to walk confidently into the plan of the Lord. Let everyone say amen. God is good. Let's all stand to our feet for the reading of God's word. Our scriptures out of 2 Timothy chapter 8. 2 Timothy chapter 8. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal joy. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against crawling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Here's our key verse for today. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved of worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and you bless it to our hearts. Would you fill each one of us with your love? We are having our hearts open to you right now because we need a word from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I've asked our young people to uh, pass out some cards. We young people, you can do it now. And I'm asking them to pass out the cards that are basically advertisements. They're not actual tickets because when people come on Saturday, they are coming and making a free will offer of the nation. So give them each, give them each two, two each, young people, give them two each. And what I'd like you to do with those tickets is to invite two or three of your neighbors. And we want to see this place right and I can do it with over 300, excuse me, over 300 people on Saturday night. We've been doing it on Fridays for the first three Fridays of July, but it's this Saturday night. And it's going to be the Greenwich family singing to my brothers and sisters, my nieces and nephews, and some of my grandchildren will be there. And we are just going to be praising the Lord with all kind of musical styles of music, and it's going to be good. We have a whole band that's backing us up. And so you'll be blessed. And so this is a part of our evangelism as a church. And so we want you to invite your neighbors and come for a good enjoyment. We're going to be uh, selling hot dogs and hamburgers for a real reasonable price. But most of all, we're going to be declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe you'll be blessed. It'll be outdoors on the lawn. And this verse says to be approved by God or work with. And God is calling us at this time to approve ourselves to do his work. And I am so excited about this church because we are focusing in on the priorities of God. We're not doing things that are ingrown. We're not doing things that are inward. We're not doing things that are self-centered. But we are doing things that are Christ-centered. And because of that, I believe we're moving in the priorities of God. And ultimately, we're going to be blessed. Now, as you look at this passage in Timothy, the Apostle Paul was a writer of the book of Timothy. And Paul had a special relationship with the receiver of this letter. And his name was Timothy. Paul loved Timothy very, very much. He mentored and he trained Timothy in the ways of the Lord. Paul loved Timothy so much that he referred to Timothy as his son. His son in the Lord. And how many of you know when you have a son or a daughter and that person is close to you, you do things for them and you're close to them. You go out to the ball game. You go out and have some ice cream with them. You take them places and you just have a good time. Because it's your son and your daughter, you do those special things. And Paul loved them dearly and spent time with Timothy as much as he could. You and I also have established special relationships in our lives. Just like Paul had this special relationship with Timothy, all of you have special relationships. Now those of you that may be single, or those of you that married at this time, Pastor David, that's a question for you. How many of you have a special relationship with somebody? 
you can marry a sexual agent and hire a special relationship. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, most of us have a special relationship with somebody, and we're proud to say we have that special relationship. Because that relationship is one where they know us and we know them. Now, the relationship that Paul had with Timothy is indicative of something that I have put in the bulletin probably now for over a year. And that's one up, one over, and one down. And one up is, and in the bulletin it says, one up is that every one of us should have a relationship where somebody is mentoring us, that we look up to somebody, that we can go to them in prayer when we're having difficulties, when we don't understand something in the scripture, and so that's our one up. And then one over is somebody who we co-labor with in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We co-labor with in doing God's will. We co-labor in doing good things. We may work together in the food pantry. We may work together in the choir ministry. Or we may work together in teaching children. A co-labor, that's your one over. Somebody you can call and say, would you pray with me on this situation? And then the one down relationship, which is mentioned in the bulletin, is somebody that you mentor. And some of you may say, you know, I'm not strong enough. I'm not really a knowledgeable enough Christian that I can mention someone or disciple someone else. And you know what? Somebody is watching you. So whether you think you're qualified or not, somebody's watching you. I'll give you an example. When I was a young boy, and I think I mentioned part of the story not, not but a couple of Sundays ago, when I was a young boy growing up in New York, and I went to church just like some of you young people at church, there was this guy that came to our church, this man, and his name was Lester Walton. And I'll never forget Lester Walton's name because he came into the church one Sunday. My dad was preaching the gospel. I told you my dad was a pastor and he went home to be with the Lord. And he was just preaching the word of the Lord. And then he gave an invitation for people to receive Christ. And this guy, Lester, came forward. Well, Lester's history was Lester was a heroin addict. I mean, Lester was hooked on drugs. He kind of stumbled in and he stumbled into the church. He listened to the message. He was high as a kite, but when the word of the Lord went forth, and my dad said, do you want to receive Christ? And he came forward to the altar, and he gave his heart to the Lord. Lester was instantly healed of his heart addiction. And he gave the testimony the next Sunday and said, I was high, I was loaded, but that thing that was over me was broken, and I am a changed man. <laughs> he came into church all scruffy. I remember the Sunday he came in, wasn't looking that cool. Next Sunday, he had a suit on and a tie, looked like a different man. And as a young boy, he swallowed out the, wow, God's power can change something like that. I mean, it had an impact on me. And that same man, Lester, ended up becoming a leader in our church. He got on the deacon board. He got on the trustee board. He became the treasurer of the church. And he sang in the choir. And for almost a 10-year period of time, I saw this man grow in his faith. And as a young man, he became my one up. He didn't even know it. I didn't even talk to him that much. But just watch him serve in the church. Watch him his life be changed. I said, well, I want to be like this. God bless him. He got a great job in one of the top banks in downtown New York. The man was blessed. He prospered and did well. He got married to one of the young ladies in church. And then the story ended the brother. Years later, after we moved out here from the East Coast to the West Coast, he caught cancer and he died at an early age. He died in his 50s. But less than for the life that he lived, he lived it unto God and he became my one up. And all of you today have somebody who's watching you. You don't even know they're watching. So I don't want you to ever feel like, well, Pastor, I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough in the things of God. I don't know enough about the Word of God that I can be a one up for somebody. Somebody's watching you, and you can be a factor for the kingdom of God. Let the church say amen. amen. Praise God. So Paul had a special relationship with Timothy. When Paul was giving Timothy instructions, he always referred back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul was Christ-centered in his advice to Timothy. When you and I give advice to young people, or you give advice to another person that you're mentoring, be Christ-centered. Yes, you can give them your opinion, and you can say what you think 
about that and how life has given you some life experiences and you can talk about this and that, but be Christ-centered in the council. Point them back to the cross. Point them back to the things that Jesus said. Point them back to the things that are truly of God. And if you do, you will be blessed. Notice what Paul says in verse 8, continuing to point to Jesus Christ. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. Paul refers to our risen Lord, a victorious Savior, that he proclaims the gospel. Okay, this sermon this morning is going to be interactive, and some Sundays I do that. And so this Sunday is going to be one of them. Who can tell me, because Paul refers to the gospel in this message, who can tell me what is the gospel? What is that word? What's the gospel? Talk to me. The good news. Penny said the good news. Who can tell me what that good news is? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ what? Risen from the dead, and before he rose from the dead, man, he... He died on the cross for our sins. The gospel message that Jesus came from earth, he was God, came from earth, he came and took the form of a human person, he died on the cross, and he arose from the dead, and he's in heaven, and the Bible said he's seated on the right hand of the Father, now is he going to stay for heaven all eternity, or is he going to do something else? He's coming back, Brother Louis said. He is coming back. And that's the gospel message. When you and I can tell somebody that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. You know, I have heard that Jesus died on the cross all my life. Being the son of a preacher, Brother Joaquin, oh, I just heard that message over and over again. And I took it for granted. But one day, Brother King, when I heard the message of the Lord, it came to me one Sunday morning, and here was the message. David, you done wrong, you're a sinner, and you need to be saved. Because you know what I used to think, Caleb? And I'm going to talk to Caleb just like one on one. I used to think, Caleb, that I was going to heaven just because my daddy was a preacher. Isn't that something? Well, my dad's a pastor of the church, so I know I'm going to heaven. So you know what I did with that kind of thing, Caleb? I would go out on Sunday and sit in church with my hands folded, and I would just be nice. And the older ladies in church would come and tap me on the head, say, Sister Lou, that was my mom saying, Sister Lou, David is such a precious child. He's such a wonderful boy. I love him. As soon as I got out of that church, Brother Ted, I'd be running and fighting and cussing like the devil. I mean, I would tour from Monday to Saturday, and then on Sunday morning, I'd sit in church just like this. Now, I don't know nobody else. So God wants to 
save you just like he saved me. And that's what the gospel message does. It saves the human heart. I said this on Friday night and I'll say it again. Just don't become a word this week. That man in Colorado shot up those people in the theater. And I thought to myself, gospel message. Those people wouldn't have to die. Isn't that a shame? The gospel message of Jesus Christ is the cure for the human heart that's gone bad. That's why what we're doing this week with the children. That's why what you're doing, you're inviting your friends. And we're going to see all these people come on our premises. And we're going to see the power of the Lord manifest. It will change lives. And it can change someone's heart. The gospel is also something that we at times will suffer for. Look in your outline that I provided for you. Point number one, to write this down. We suffer at times in our lives for the gospel. We suffer at times in our lives right in for the gospel. The gospel is what we are about. The gospel is what we at times have to suffer for. Look at verse 9. For which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. When you and I decide that I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus, sometimes people don't want to hear it. And sometimes they make fun of you. Sometimes you've got to suffer for it. But I'd rather suffer for what's right. I'd rather suffer for truth than go do something that's wrong and regret it later on. When I'm doing God's will and suffering for the gospel, it's a good thing to do. In our suffering for the gospel, we also have to God that freely works in our lives. When you and I suffer for the gospel, he sends his word. He sends his word, his revelation. He sends thoughts. He, he leads us in various scriptures. And the scriptures that he leads us to what enable us to be a better child of God. Praise God. <clears throat> the word of God is so important in the life of every believer. How many of you have your own Bible? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Now you don't have to raise your hand on this one. Next question. How many of you read your Bible on a consistent basis? Consistent basis. Oh, wonderful. Some hands went up. Well, I figured out, Brother Mike, that there are 168 hours in a week. How many of you spend more than just one hour a week? Reading, studying God's word. Okay. okay. When we read the word of God, when we meditate on this book, or if you have it in your phone, or if you have it on a media device, when we meditate on the word of God, when we memorize the word of God, and here's the most important thing: many people know the word of God, but many people are not living the word of God. And therefore, many people are not relying on the Word of God. You and I need to rely on the Word. Don't make the Word of God just something you know up here, but you don't know down here. What does that mean? That it doesn't reflect in your lifestyle. The Word of God will sustain you. The Word of God will keep you. And the Word of God will help you as you go through times of suffering. Here's three examples of people who suffered in the Scripture. Paul and Silas were on their way doing God's will. I'm reminding you on business. And this little girl kept calling on the name. Paul and Silas, these men that do the will of God, these men that are, are, are spokesmen for God. And this woman was, she was actually a young girl, she was demon possessed. So in short, make story quick, Paul cast the demon out of her. Even though she didn't see when he was doing anything wrong. All she was really doing was stating who they were. But Paul knew they were demon possessed because they were making money. The girl was making money for her owner because she could tell into the future. Paul cast the demon out of her. The people who made money from the girl got mad, and they got the soldiers to put Paul and Silas in jail. And once in jail, the soldiers, the Bible says, whipped Paul and Silas. Well, Paul and Silas were suffering for doing good. They let the girl go and be free of that demon, but they suffered for doing good. And what did Paul and Silas do? They decided to pray and praise the Lord. Did God get them out of that jail? So in your suffering, God will get you out of the jail that you're in. You don't know when it's going to happen, but 
depend on God, he'll get you out. Another example of suffering is King David was God's anointed servant, and he was coming on the scene, and Saul, his predecessor, who was king at the time, didn't like David because he was popular with the people. And Saul decided that he wanted to kill David. Saul got a bunch of soldiers, and they ran David into the wilderness, and David was on the run, and Saul almost got David. And every time Saul was about to get David, and apprehend him, God delivered David from the hand of Saul. So David had to leave the comfort of his home because he was on the run, and he was suffering for doing the right thing. David did nothing wrong against Saul, but Saul was coming against him anyhow, and God delivered him. Another example of God delivering someone in their suffering. And then there was a Samaritan woman who was drawn water from a well and was ministered to by the living word. Jesus Christ is the living word. And Jesus spoke words of life and life to this woman and as a result was set her free because she was living in an adulterous lifestyle. She was having relationships with many men. Jesus spoke the word of the Lord and set her free. The word of the Lord will help you in your suffering, and the word of the Lord will help you as you walk through the path of life. Living by the word of the Lord leads us to our next point. Look in your outline, point number two. One of the essential qualities of being a true believer in Jesus Christ is endurance. Write down the word endurance. Let's all say endurance together. Endurance. To be able to endure. The ability to hang in there when the going gets tough. Look at verse 10. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Endurance keeps us from giving up and quitting. Paul's endurance is connected to the relationship that he has for the saints of God. He realizes that other believers are counting on him. And just like I knew that Lester was my role model in my example early in the sermon, and I looked at Lester's lifestyle and looked how he got changed, looked at how he got active in the things of God, looked how he was walking for God, and it blessed my soul, it made me want to continue in my walk after I asked Jesus to come to my heart. And at age 12, I started singing in the youth choir. And at age 12, I started getting involved in vacation Bible school, and I was a teacher sister. And because he endured it, because he was a good example, I learned to endure. And some of you young people and adults in that church, I want you to have faithfulness and have endurance in your heart and have the attitude of not quitting and have the attitude of staying on your post because as you endure, you are a witness for the next generation. Let the church say amen. We want to be endurance runners. We want to be marathon runners. Paul realizes that other believers are counting on him as an example of being a faithful soldier of the cross. Paul realizes that other people need to know that he was still ministering the way God wanted him to minister. Do you have the same mindset that the Apostle Paul had? All of us this morning are leaders and we have to learn to endure. Remember, God has called you to be a good example that others can follow. Paul realizes that the goal is to make it into glory, to see Jesus, and he wants every one of his followers to make it into glory. Point number three, write this in your outline. And this next point is so important. I'm going to let you go in the next five minutes. The key to living a victorious Christian life is to die to and write in yourself, die to yourself and to live, and to live, die to yourself and to live as unto Jesus Christ. Die to yourself and live as unto Jesus Christ. When you get to the place where you realize that Jesus is what it's all about, look at verse 11. Here's a trustworthy servant saying, if we die with him, we will also live with him. Now, is he talking about suicide here? Is he talking about something else? Talk to me, not saying to God. Paul talking about suicide when he says die to yourself? Or is he talking about something else? No, he's definitely not talking about suicide. He's talking about someone else. He says die to yourself. He didn't say kill yourself. You see how some people can live in the Word of God and, and, and change things around? We must die to the things that don't please the Lord. We must take the step of saying no. Everybody say no. no. When Andy comes to your attention, you 
say no. When the enemy comes to you and tells you to do something wrong, say no. When we do, we are allowing the presence of Jesus Christ to reign supreme in our lives. We live as unto Christ. When we die ourselves, then we have to live as unto Christ, not ourselves. And it starts with dying to itself. If you don't put a plant in the sunlight, and if you don't water it, what will happen to the plant? Talk to you. That plant will die. You don't put it in the water, it's going to die. All right, here we go. If you don't feed your wrong desires with bad TV, going to bad movies, hanging out with bad friends, but instead you do godly things, what will happen to those wrong desires? Talk to you. They'll die. And the reason why you and I have wrong desires that overtake us is because we're feeding our wrong desires. And I used to do it too. I'm not, I'm not any different than you. When I feed my wrong desires, when I get tempted in an area of my life, instead of me saying, oh, I'm going to feed that desire. I'm going to get into the Word of God. I'm going to come to church on Sunday. I'm going to come to Friday night. I'm going to come to Saturday night. I'm going to come to the prayer meeting. I'm not going to go hang out with you know. As you feed the wrong desire, you find yourself getting in trouble. But if you'll say no, if you'll die to the flesh, then you'll see the wonderful working power of God. It's time for us, some of us to die with Christ. It's time for some of us to put the line in the sand and stop feeding our bad desires. Okay, here's the next part of the sermon that's interactive. I want you now to give me some practical examples, about four or five of them. Give me some practical alternatives rather than feeding your bad desires. Give me some practical alternatives rather than feeding your bad desires. What can you do? Pray. Someone said pray. What else? Read that Bible. Yeah. Read that Bible that you got. What else? Listen to Christian music. <laughs> listen to Christian music. That's, good. That's a good point, Brother Russ. Because if all the music I listen to is berating women or berating men or talking about sexual activities, what do I end up doing? How's that old proverb grow? It's not the Bible. Birds of a feather flock what? That means you keep hanging out with somebody, you can find yourself doing with it. So hang out with some good people. Okay, what else? What are some other good alternatives? Avoid temptations and what does not one? Fast. Fast. Albert, what do you mean by fast? You know, some people say, I fasted three days this week, or I fasted for breakfast and lunch, and they bragged about the fast, the fast, but notice what Sister Bird said, but she said, spend time with the Lord. So a true fast is when you substitute the time that you're eating for more time of prayer, Bible study, and a whole time with God. That's a true fast. What else can we do? Practical alternatives. Yes. in Jesus Christ to believe that if God is on my side, who can be against me? That's what I'm talking about. Burn. Yes. When two or more are gathered, sometimes you need a friend, you need a one over. Anybody else before I continue on? Okay, then the last point of the sermon. An approved believer in Jesus Christ is one who has learned to correctly handle and write in the Word of God. The one who has correctly learned to handle the Word of God. Praise God. The Word of God. God's Word is based on the truth of Jesus Christ. The Gospel. And He is coming back. The entire Bible is Christocentric. What does that mean? That means the Bible, the verses in the Bible, from the Old Testament clear to the New Testament, point us to Jesus Christ. It is Christocentric. And you and I need to understand that we need to stay in the Word. We need to stay in the person of Jesus Christ. We need to talk about Him, learn about Him, sing about Him like Sister Jane did this morning. You need to take this book seriously. This book right here, take it seriously. Take it as the most valuable asset that you have in this life. I want you to read it. Your pages should be crinkled. You should have an outline notes in it. You should pour out when there are times that you don't understand some things. And you want an answer from God. You should 
get in the Word of God. There are times that you can't even take time to call your pastor, call your best friend. You need to get into the Word because you want God to hear you and you want to hear from God. God, through the precious Holy Spirit, will lead you in correct interpretation and understanding of the, understanding of the Scriptures. So you need to stand in the Word of God. And then the scripture says, when you are in the word of God, you are going to be approved by God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed. And I want to conclude with this. In Ephesians, it says, in chapter 2, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do the works. And if the church of Jesus Christ, well, instead of focusing, as it says in the chapter, there's an illustration that he uses. He says in, in Timothy, in the beginning of the chapter, he says, if you're a soldier of the Christ, you focus in as a soldier in the natural on doing the military activities of the army or the navy or the air force. And then he says this in the beginning of the Timothy. He says, you don't take time to get involved in civilian affairs or civilian affairs. That's like if you want to be a mayor or if you want to be a governor. And that's a good thing. I mean, it's a good thing to serve in a civilian life. But it says you don't take time to get into civilian affairs, but you spend time as an army soldier being involved, being involved in army activities. And what does that mean for us as the Church of Jesus Christ? There's so many things that are symbolic of civilian affairs that can distract us. There's so many things in the church that we can get bound up and tangled up and wound up into that are not bad in the sense of being wrong or temple. They are just not the priority. The priority is to stay in the military. And those of you that don't like the military, use another example. Okay, but for sake of discussion, stay in the world of God. Stay in the right area that God wants you to stay in. And don't allow yourself to get off track. So this week, we are in high alert. We are moving to the end of the month of July activities, and there are about 10 people that I want to invite for Saturday night, and I want to invite their kids to vacation Bible camp. There's a several of my neighbors on my block that I'm looking for opportunities, and God is just miraculously allowing them to come into my path and they're having conversations, and I'm intending to invite them to the house of God because I'm on assignment. I'm on, and I'm not going to allow myself to get detracted. This week, I'm not going to Home Depot and buy a new couch. I mean, this week, I'm not going down to this place and that place. 